Now what we have today of course is a very, very important issue being discussed and it really does relate to what we've been hearing a lot about anyway in relation to class actions. And that's the key issues regarding the rise of litigation funders and proposed reforms which might impact on their operations in Australia. Um, I'm Samantha Marks. Uh, Peter Reardon and I both represent the bar in giving some um, comments on this. And um, chiefly our interest is that the cases we want to be involved in or are involved in are often funded by litigation funders. We of course also have um, Justice Michelle Gordon um, who, of the Federal Court who obviously has also been the decider and continues to be in many of the cases that this relates to. And we're also assisted today by um, uh, Stuart, I'm uh, sorry, by um, Jason Betts and of course David Leggett, both of whom I know well and my apologies for that, who will give us the solicitor's perspective. And of course um, all of those perspectives are very important as we talk about this. So can I start first of all by asking you David, you started practising insurance law in 1992 before any sort of litigation funding was allowed. That's right. What do you see as the key changes that have occurred in litigation as a result? Well, thank you, Samantha, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I have been a lifer at Phillips Fox. I'm obviously giving you the defence perspective, even though we're now called uh, DLA Piper. Um, when I started in 1992, there wasn't the idea of, uh, of uh, litigation funding, but it, perhaps with some irony, the, the first litigation funding products around are actually insurance policies. Uh, and one was drafted by a partner of uh, Philip Fox at the time called Chris Charles, and there was also a broker called Cadet, a broker Aon, uh, that would sell a policy to a liquidator that would cover adverse costs. And then that policy sort of started to grow a few additional things on it and provide some funding of disbursements or funding of opinions uh, to be able to support a liquidator taking an, taking an action. Um, and so that, that product was quite common during the 1990s. It was very tightly held. Uh, and then we started to get a few private, what I'd saw, well, wealthy friends sort of funding arrangements coming in where we'd uh, sit at a mediation trying to settle something and it'd be another guy there and go, well, who are you? You know, And he'd go, well, I'm the writing the cheques and I'm going to get basically most of the uh, money once this thing's finished. And the insurers didn't like that. It was completely unregulated. Uh, sometimes you really were dealing with some people that were just out and out corrupt. Um, but at the same time, it, it identified the need that there were a lot of people who just didn't have the funding or the backing to be able to run a significant action. Um, and then the, probably the next point was there was this awful case called Ultratune uh, that had arguments about champerty and maintenance. The basic idea being that uh, if someone who doesn't have an interest in the, in the case is, is not allowed to fund it because it effectively uh, 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 takes control away from the control away from the plaintiff and my recollection of that case is it went for months before anything got decided as everyone was arguing about whether or not the funding le agreement was legitimate. So in that sense when the High Court actually um, uh, handed down its decision in Fostiff, um, it was really a welcome and f actually from the defence perspective quite a quite an awarded decision because it actually clarified the market and it actually introduced some real discipline. And really the key points, and we obviously will talk about Fostiff a little bit further, but just practically um, what the case said is that the plaintiffs, the, the agreement with the funder is legitimate, um, but the plaintiff has still got to have control of the case in relation to that funding agreement. The funder's got to agree to meet any adverse costs orders. Um, it's something that really should be disclosed to the other parties. And the commission received by the funder should not really be usurious. And the way it's interpreted in the market, particularly with the main <coughs> funder being IMF, generally it's a scale of about 30 to 40% commission uh, as the deal uh, in terms of meeting uh, adverse cost orders and also providing all the funding of the lawyers. Thank you. Time, I'm going to direct a question across to you, Justice Gordon. From a judicial perspective, um, what is it that you have seen changing with the advent of litigation funders? Thanks, Samantha. Um, can I build on what David has mentioned? Um, litigation funding is now an absolute part of the litigation landscape and the courts accept that and in large part we have to embrace it. The rationale for them was set out, I think, probably most clearly by Justice Kirby in Fostiff and if it worked it would come up. But what Justice Kirby uh, outlined is the economic rationale yes. for it. Small claims, small number of people, sorry, large number of people, small claims, up against expensive running litigation, how do you meet the two? And he therefore rationalised the reason why we need litigation funders. 
From a court's perspective, that means a number of things have changed. And that means the participants, and I use that term in, gen in very broad terms, has changed. We've now not just got a plaintiff and defendant and their solicitors, but we've got funders. And in addition to the funders, we've also brought with them uh, differentiation between group members and non-group members, between those who participate in the funding by signing up with the law firm or not signing up with the law firm, which is attached to the funder. The second thing is, the reason why those changes in the participants from our perspective is important is because, as we've seen from the draft report from the Productivity Commission, a lot of that's been unregulated and courts have expressed concerns about the very things that the High Court talked about in Foster. Who's controlling the litigation? Has there been disclosure about the terms and arrangements between these parties? And if so, are they fair? And if not, what do we do about it? And a lot of that's been done at the end, at the settlement process, when I think the courts have expressed views that they really should be considered at the beginning of the process rather than at the end. The second thing we've noticed is that the, no, the identity of the funders has changed. And although some of the funders are well known, some of them um, vary in size, that is the size of the funder themselves and the resources behind them, where they're located, a lot of them are located offshore. We've seen that the connection with the legal profession has been closer in some instances than in others. And secondly, we've also seen that um, the terms upon which they deal vary quite significantly between those funders. There are no standard terms in these arrangements. There are no standard structures in these arrangements. And for my part, that's a question which I think in the future will need to be addressed. And I speak only for myself. We don't need a straitjacket. If there's to be regulation, then it's not to be what I call strict rules, but more general ideas and concepts against which we can stress it. The other thing is, is that we've seen quite significant changes in the way in which the classes or the proceedings have been set up, and we'll talk about that later. So you might ask, why in the hell am I as a judge even worried about these things when the litigation comes and I'm supposed to just decide it? Uh, for our part, and the federal court's been very um, vocal about this, we remain of the view that we do have a role to play and a particular responsibility to various groups, and they include the participants that are before the courts, and we, as a court, are very concerned to make sure that those participants are protected, either by way of some self-regulation, which we initially suggested, or, as the Productivity Commission seems to be suggesting, some more formal regulation, although we wouldn't put forward a straitjacket, as I've said. One of the concepts that the federal courts put forward is the possibility of what we would call an approvals judge, and that is a judge who would consider these sorts of a question, these questions at the commencement of the proceeding, mm -hmm absent from the trial judge, in order to try and see whether or not we can't provide some protection to these sorts of quite significant changes in the overall landscape. Thank you. Jason, what strike you as the key changes? Probably three observations that constitute the key changes. We've seen a rise in the prevalence of class action litigation. Funding has grown consistently and concurrently with class action litigation. By prevalence, I mean I don't mean the filings of, of class action litigation because while that has increased in a steady rate, class actions comprise less than 1% of the federal court's business by volume, but we have seen an increase in the complexity and the quantum associated with significant shareholder class action claims and other types of claims. 70% of all class actions are now funded by a third party litigation funder. So that's been one very noticeable impact. We, we've also seen, as Justice Gordon mentioned, a deepening in the sophistication of the Australian market for third party litigation funding. We've seen the entry into our market of significant international foreign based litigation funders encouraged possibly by at least two things, the, the prohibition in our jurisdiction on lawyers charging contingency fees, true contingency fees, at least at this stage and also the absence in our jurisdiction of a true series of regulations for third party litigation funding. So there was a hole, funders are start, third party funders are starting to fill it. Thirdly, from my perspective most importantly, has been the impact on those that are the targets of class action litigation. So in our discursive, there's an important conversation around class actions about access to justice. What is sometimes not discussed as vigorously is the, the, the impact, cost, reputational, distraction, 
and other associated with class action litigation against, uh, from the targets of that, that form of litigation. They're enormously expensive to prosecute and defend. They create significant reputational damage for those that are the targets. They, they are a long time in the resolution and they're often quite expensive to resolve. So they've changed the, the discussion in Australia at the board level about what the key litigation risks are. Thank you. And Peter? Uh, I only want to add one uh, matter to what's already been said. As Justice Gordon pointed out in Foster, the, um, the reason why the court allowed litigation funding was it was seen to promote access to justice. And as we know from as far back as the Law, Law Reform Commission, the reason why class actions were allowed was for purposes of access to justice. That's all very well, but the dark side, in my view, that's arisen within 10 years of Fostive is the combination of those two have meant that the elephant in the room is that now with litigation funding class actions, there is a massive profit motive for why funders and lawyers want to commence funded class actions. And this has led, and we have to be at a serious risk of it continuing to lead, to an inversion of our justice system. Where our justice system came from were people got aggrieved and they then sought redress in the courts for their grievance, and lawyers found them a cause of action. What we're finding now is that some lawyers and funders are finding a cause of action and then searching out some person who might be aggrieved. And so the principal purpose of this action, the principal and, and precipitating purpose, is not the resolution of an agreement. It's rather a profit that's available, and we'll hear something about it, I think, from David, the sorts of profits that are made. Um, now, there's got to be a concern about that. If we're an honourable profession and we want to maintain what reputation we have, then I think we have to deal with that question. Um, that inversion, I think, is probably demonstrated the, the 2006 bushfires class action was commenced by a firm of solicitors and ultimately dismissed because they didn't have a client. They just issued a class action and couldn't find a client. Um, you've got, I suggest, a number of uh, actions at the moment commenced where there are very large numbers of members, very large group, very small amounts of losses. Plainly enough, together, it's a significant amount of money and therefore the funders, it's worthwhile for the funders because the gross amount of the money by totalling up lots of small amounts of, of claims, which is part of the purpose, but those large returns make it worthwhile for the lawyers and the funders. Now, I, I accept that there's a respectable view that what is happening with these sort of actions is, is it's discouraging wrongful conduct, the charging of fees that might be small but are not in the interest of the public, the question that we need to deal with is whether that's better dealt with through this profit motive or whether it's better dealt with by ASIC or ACCC. And frankly, I'm, I'm very concerned that our legal system, which is funded at great expense by the public, doesn't get too bound up in these actions um, and our reputation doesn't suffer by becoming really ambulance chasers on steroids. Well, there's certainly changes happening and whether we're moving um, closer to what occurs in other jurisdictions or not is something we'll deal with a little bit later. But can I ask you this, Peter? Do you think that it matters whether we're looking at having an open class, a closed class, or, or how that affects that issue? Sure, Samantha. The, if you'd permit me, on the off chance that everybody doesn't fully understand the rather subtle difference between open class closed class and class closure, um, I think it's worthwhile making sure that we are all talking about the same thing. Um, an open class is what was always envisaged to be the way a class action would be conducted, certainly by the Law Reform Commission, mm. whereupon the action would be brought on behalf of all persons who have suffered loss, 
by reason of whatever the wrongful conduct of the defendant might be said to have been. Now, that's what the Law Reform Commission suggested, but in fact, by reason of section 33.1 of the, of the Act, uh, which provided that a proceeding may be commenced by one or more group members as representing some or all of them. It's been accepted since Multiplex that we can have what's now been called closed, uh, uh, a closed class. The closed class can be any part of that group who suffered the loss. And including, and most controversially, a closed class might be anybody who suffered a loss as a result of conduct X by Y, who has registered with our legal firm. And that is one of the controversial methods, and that's the closed class. Now, a closed class has certain advantages. Plainly from a funder's point of view, it means that they are able to get people signed up so that there's an agreement as to what their remuneration will be, what the fees will be, et cetera, because it's, it's going to be known. There will be a list throughout the course of it. Uh, and it avoids freeloaders and, frankly, management of litigation, identification of the assessment, both for the plaintiff and the defendant, becomes possible when you've got a closed class, a registered list of, of people who are bringing it. And, um, and so for those, for those reasons, it, it, it's, an, it's an attractive form. It's got some drawbacks, and obviously it limits the number of beneficiaries. The whole purpose of the access to justice was to allow everybody in that class to be able to recover by reason of this action and not select class. Of course, the other, the other problem that arises is that it might be in the interest of the funder and the lawyers just to select the big losses out of the class. So the big, the, the group members who have suffered major losses would be selected in some manner or another and forget about the people who have suffered the smaller losses. And of course, that suffers from the that the very vice that they were meant to resolve, and that was that people with small losses, not otherwise recoverable, were intended to be the ones who would get the benefit from it all. So it has its drawbacks, and I know others can, will deal with that as well, but let me, it's probably just, so again we're clear, it should be made plain that closed class is different to class closure, despite the, uh, the similar sounding names. A closed class is when the class section is brought, the, or later, I might say, the class is defined in such a way that it's not everybody who suffered the loss. Class closure is a different concept, which came about, I think McMullen was the case, when they got, after liability had been determined in favour of the class, and the defendant was therefore wanting to make payments so that the appropriate compensation could be paid, and the difficulty was they identified this could go forever. There could people coming up, could be coming out for 10 or 20 years saying, oh, by the way, I'm in the class. So class closure had nothing to do with the definition of class. Class closure was to say everybody who's going to claim now has to come forward and identify themselves. And if you don't do that by a certain date after appropriate publication and the like, then you'll be, you'll be locked out. And the best demonstration of it was in the Kilmore bushfires where Justice Jack Forrest used both techniques. He got to a stage where he thought, hadn't determined liability, but had got to a stage where he thought that settlement should, the settlement prospects should be maximised. So with respect to people who'd suffered property damage, he closed the class and said, if you want to make a claim, you've got to come forward now and make the claim. And if you haven't opted out, that will mean that if you don't come forward, you'll be shut out for all time. But with respect to personal injuries, he, he redefined the class and made it a closed class so that anybody who'd suffered personal injuries had to register and they would then fall within the closed class. The effect of that meant that those who didn't register for the closed class still had their cause of action because they weren't part of the class and therefore they weren't uh, they, their action wasn't disposed of. So it was an interesting case where, in one case, he used both devices for, substantially for the same purpose to get different results. And, and Peter, I think it would be fair to say that the devices are being used differently in different, different cases. 
yes. different judges are favouring um, one or other. And I'd be interested in a moment to hear from Justice Gordon on that. But first of all, from the solicitor's perspective, and in particular from a funder's perspective, Jason. Well, uh, picking up the topic of closed classes, um, we can discuss it uh, later in the session, but the economic incentives for a promoter of a class action to commence the proceedings as a closed class are clear. Uh, they exclude from the equation people who aren't prepared to engage in the terms that the litigation fund is offering. Free loaders. Free, free, free loaders, as, <laughs> as Justice Gordon uh, correctly labels them. Uh, the issue, two issues arise and two very quick observations. One is closed classes, and the debate is now clear, raise uh, questions of access to justice. Access to justice, justice issues arise because of the exclusionary characteristics. And I'm a, I'm a defendant's lawyer, so it's perhaps unnatural for me to talk about access to justice issues, but there is a debate in, in, as to whether it is appropriate for class actions to exclude uh, the, the, arguably the very claimants that they were designed to uh, protect and involve the participation of. So, for example, in the shareholder class action context, typically a shareholder class action which alleges continuous disclosure contraventions on behalf of listed Australian entities, the claim group will comprise one or two hundred reasonably large and sophisticated institutional shareholders who individually have reasonably significant claims. It will exclude retail investors and arguably those are the very investors whose claims are so small that they, are, they were the people that the system was designed to involve in the class action resolution mechanism. But more, I'm sure, on the debate about access to justice later. Just from a, a practical solicitor's perspective, one challenge that closed classes give rise to are very difficult doctrinal and procedural questions about how to manage and resolve the closed class. Yeah. That arises in two ways. Uh, if a closed class is commenced against a defendant, uh, there is a real risk of a competing class action. An initial closed class is filed on behalf of Group X, defined by reference to engagement with a litigation funder, and, and during the pendency of that claim, a second competing class action is commenced on behalf of perhaps the balance of the putative claim group, the people who didn't agree to the funder's terms, a practice sometimes called remaindering. Now, the problem with the practice is it, you now face two class actions, subject matters similar. It may not be identical. Different groups, different lawyers representing those groups, possibly different pleadings, possibly different evidence and different theories of causation and loss. The defendant needs to manage that together with the judiciary and, and the lawyers for the plaintiff. It's difficult. Some suggestions have been identified around case management protocols to accommodate that potential risk and disparity, but n none have really been sufficiently debated to, to warrant a conclusive characterisation as being effective. The, the other risk that arises is circumstances where a single closed class is commenced but no remaindering occurs. And now the defendant is faced with a difficult proposition. Does that defendant seek to resolve the closed class and in doing so possibly trigger a subsequent proceeding, the remainder, um, or does it seek to litigate that claim to conclusion knowing that there's a tail risk out there that needs to be subsequently managed? That can be chilling on the propensity of the defendant to wish to resolve the proceedings at an early stage. And some solutions have been discussed around how to avoid that arising, including, and we'll address this later, a common fund doctrine which would arguably uh, remove the need to have closed classes in order to resolve the economic incentives of the funder. Thank you. Thanks, look, and I'll be brief in adding to that. In my field, which is um, uh, acting on instructions of insurers often defending class actions against directors, um, you have a limited pot of insurance money uh, and, the, and the pot erodes. So let's say you've got a $20 million limit that erodes with the defence costs. Uh, so closed classes are a real nuisance uh, because uh, you've, got your in, you've got your director sitting there, they've got one closed class, uh, we're going to spend money defending that eroding the limit uh, and then we're going to have another one. Um, so if we, if we try and have a settlement, I've got to say, well, you know, you're probably still going to have an uninsured exposure because this ain't going to finish it. You know, we're going to, or we're going to have to keep a pot of money for all the other closed classes that are going to come about. And in the US, where they don't have this open and then class closure, and we just had two partners from, um, from San Diego um, present to us last night, um, defence firms are often dealing with 15 to 20 different plaintiff firms 
uh, in relation to the same class section. And the plaintiff bar is organising themselves uh, to try and mediate, to try and get a common uh, approach from all of these firms. Um, so closed classes are a nuisance. They're very, very difficult to settle. Uh, and particularly when you've got a, a limited pot of insurance that's eroding with defence costs, um, I think it creates a significant injustice. Thank you. We really need far longer than three quarters of an hour for this session because there's so much to cover. But I'm going to ask um, Your Honour, uh, Justice Gordon, from the judicial perspective on that point. Um, no one likes closed classes. Uh, applicants don't like them, defendants don't like them, and nor do the courts. Um, and I want to do two things. First, why do they exist? Well, they exist because of litigation funding, and funders don't want to take on everybody. They want to take on a portion of a class. And that's, we need to put that up front, because once we understand that's the reason for it, then you, I think, pretty well demonstrate what the problems are with it. You're always going to have a tale, whether it's a tale which is known or it's not known. That also leads to competing actions. From a court's perspective, to have multiple actions, usually and sometimes in different courts, is not good for the administration of justice or the access to justice because there are double costs for applicants. That's a reduction in costs that, or reduction in return to them. And at the same time, it's not good for the reasons that the defence um, solicitors have identified. So from a judici judicial perspective, I don't like them for that reason either. How do you manage them? Well, as Jason said, um, that's difficult from a judicial perspective, but there have been mechanisms that have been adopted and in some cases they've been opened um, for very good reason. Um, primarily, if you look at the cases, it's been where there's been a lack of disclosure on the part of one um, law firm that's commenced the action. Um, in some instances, there's been a suggestion of staying some proceedings pending the resolution of um, what we call the lead case in order to try and limit the costs. That itself creates problems because you need end up having a settlement with the lead and then you've got the other one sitting there and do you leverage and is it a form of green mailing and there's a whole lot of allegations going on. The third aspect about it is, is whether or not the court should conduct some beauty parade and in effect choose and be the arbiter and that's one of the issues that the court's looking at in terms of the approvals judge and whether or not the, that the court would look at it. The difficulty about that is what criteria do you use? Do you develop them? Is it by reference to skill? Is it by reference to fee? What, are the, what is the criteria going to use to adopt it? And do you look at adopting some of the procedures that have been adopted in the USA and Canada? And they haven't worked too well, to just ask, as David said, when you've got 15 law firms competing. So they're real issues for the future if we're going to continue to permit this form of sort of multiple class, multiple, multiple closed actions leading to multiple proceedings. One of the solutions has been mentioned is the possibility of common fund applications. And that's, I think, something which we as a profession, uh, by the profession I mean all of us, have to give serious consideration to. And it's really prevention rather than cure from my perspective and something that, as most of the room know, I'm a prevention rather than cure girl. Um, what do you do? Well, you make application to the court to create a common fund. That is an entitlement that those people who, upon the success of the case, who funded it, get a percentage of it, and um, that percentage is approved by the court. Uh, again, I'm not one who favours some strict set of rules and percentages, because I think they must vary depending upon the circumstances of the case, and there needs to be flexibility. Um, but it's important because the approval would be sort of the commencement, not halfway through, not at the end. It would provide I think some foundation, and we'll talk about this more, of providing a more solid basis for both the applicants and the defendants and the th issues that have been raised by Jason and also by David. Uh, the question is whether the court's got power to do it. Um, my Chief Justice would kill me if I said we don't have power to do it. Um, I have no doubt that we do have power, but if there's any doubt about it, I have no doubt that the government could be persuaded to give us legislation that would give, give us power to do it. Why, do we have, why is that a relevant issue? because it's arguable that we wouldn't have a matter before us. Mm. And the question is, is at what time would this sort of application be made? It would be made before the commencement of the proceeding mm. in order to make good the sort of issues and meet the sort of concerns that the people on the table have expressed. Thank you. Um, Jason. Well, you've, you've, you've previously called the Common Fund Doctrine the Holy Grail for, for litigation funders. Um, and um, why? Well, uh, I think uh, 
it, we've talked about the, the economic incentives for closed classes and, and some of the problems that closed classes give rise to. Um, and as Justice Gordon has, has, has very clearly demonstrated, the, the jurisprudence for a common fund arises out of the United States. And the theory is when someone works to create re recovery on behalf of a group of people, the beneficiaries of that recovery um, sh should be entitled to, or should be required to contribute to the costs of that process. That's the theory, and jurisprudentially, it's now sought to be transplanted into the Australian jurisprudence. Um, it, why is it attractive? Well, effectively, it makes open classes economically viable for those that promote class actions. It removes the book build process. The funder doesn't need to assemble a critical mass of claimants and, and assess whether they have an economically viable class action before commencement. They know they will obtain recovery from all putative claimants. Uh, it also uh, removes the free rider or free loader problem. It doesn't matter that you don't have a funding arrangement with someone, you'll get a percentage of any recovery on their behalf. Um, and it probably leads, as, as we've discussed, to greater certainty on the part of the funder. They know at the start of the case uh, how much potentially they will recover from the prosecution of the claim. But it's not without its potential problems either. As Justice Gordon has said, one wonders how the court will assess uh, a common fund application brought before it at the start of the case. For example, in the United States, common fund assessments are made at the conclusion of the case after the court can apprehend how much work uh, the creator of the fund has put in to create that fund and set the calibration of the recovery accordingly. But in Australia, these orders are, are being sought, will be sought at the start of the proceedings. And so the court has an unenviable task of assessing what's appropriate in terms of that calibration. Uh, secondly, and, and cynically, it, it may um, incentivise promoters of class actions to race to the courtroom, for want of a better term. It is in the incentive to be a first mover when a common fund doctrine is in place, because if you can capture the class initially, you have shut out competitors and, and, and in the process shut out the possibility of competing claims. Uh, and uh, lastly, although um, uh, f f far beyond the scope of today's debate, it raises very interesting doctrinal questions about whether it's appropriate to impose on often unknown group members who are members of this putative class, uh, the terms of a funding arrangement in circumstances where they may not even know about the proceedings. Now, of course, a potential answer to that is that everyone will have the opportunity to opt out of the proceedings, but I've always found the opt-out right to be the most illusory of the rights because one opts out in circumstances when one may never even know about the proceedings, so that opportunity may not arise. But secondly, once you've opted out, you're left to prosecute a claim on your own. Well, the reason you were a part of the class action vehicle was that it wasn't economical to do that. So that's just a short way of saying there are a lot of doctrinal problems that need to be grappled with about common fund doctrine, but they do, they do show promise as resolving some of the issues that have arisen with the closed class. Thank you. David. Oh, look, I don't have anything to add. It's been comprehensively covered. All right. I think you were going to say something about IMF. Yeah, that's right. But I could, if you could put the next slide up um, to actually just see, um, because we're going to move into an argument about or discussion about the Productivity Commission report, which actually concludes that contingency fees should be allowed. Um, the, um, uh, these are the returns that um, are being made uh, by the biggest litigation funder, which is a publicly listed company called IMF. Um, and you'll see that um, they've got a very impressive loss rate, 1.4%, uh, I think 3.2 million they've actually had to pay out, uh, with a whopping return on investment of 291%. Now, the issue uh, that, that as a profession we've got to grapple with is that is the return for really providing two things to the market. Uh, one is the capital, obviously, and the second one is having acted on the instructions of litigation funders, they certainly bring a discipline to the lawyers that they uh, use so, and they're and they're very skillful uh, in relation to uh, the cases that they scrutinise and the cases that they fund. So when you do have IMF behind a funded action as a defendant, you just have to take it seriously because they have done their homework and they're serious about what they do and they've got the track record to back it up. The overall uh, position, this is the concern of the Productivity Commission, is 291% return on equity. Uh, you know, is that, is that cost of uh, providing this funding just too high and can it be done cheaper if we introduce contingency fees? Yes. Uh, so contingency fees, flavour of the month, now being suggested uh, by the Productivity Commission in its draft report. Um, how's that going to impact 
on litigation <laughs> funders, how it's going to impact on the way class actions are, are developing. Justice Gordon. Well, it's been rebadged. You always, if you don't like something, you rebadge it. Um, it's called damages-based billing. Um, first of all, why is it back on the table? I think there's two reasons. Uh, the first is, is that the issues we identified at the outset, the change in the participants. And we've now got, as I said, funders, we've got a whole range of um, offshore funders, the, not only the nature and, ch and location of them has changed, but there's a whole range of other interrelationships between multiple parties that never existed before, and the, there's a real struggle to work out how to regulate them. That's the first issue. The second issue is, and it's always difficult and dangerous to rely upon generalisations, but academics who've looked at the rate of return to applicants, that is to group members, uh, in Australia, if you add together the legal bill plus the funders' commission, it's about, on an average, 45% of the overall settlement sum. Sometimes it's up to 60 and 70% with, with the balance. Sometimes as little as 30% going to the actual plaintiffs. In America, where they don't have this dual fee, it's about, on average, about 20%. Some are larger and some are smaller, and they vary depending upon <coughs> how much is recovered, the nature of the action, and a whole range of other factors and matters that they look at in determining what is the contingency proportion. So that's the reasons why I think they're probably back on the table, <coughs> struggling and grappling with how we deal with the regulation of the interconnectedness of the new participants in the market and this quite large disparity. For my part, I think that it's clear from the productivity draft report, commission's report, that they are back on the table and we're likely to get them. So the questions which I think arise are these, and again, I don't think they are insurmountable, but what is the disclosure that should be made to the applicants, which is the point raised earlier, and should there be minimum standards and how are we going to do that, whether it's going to be by publicity and, and, and advertising that we've done in the past in relation to some things, What's going to be in that documentation? Who's going to settle it? Is the court going to have a role in it? In my view, it probably should. Again, through the concept of an approvals judge. And should there be minimum standards set? Maybe yes, maybe not. About the terms upon which those arrangements are going to be put in place. From a judicial perspective, and I step back, much concern has been expressed about the fact that this is the potential creation of conflicts of interest, mm. where you've got law firms and lawyers now having an economic outcome in the matter, not just limited to its fees, but to something more. So how do we regulate that, or how do we provide a mechanism for protection of that? And again, there are sorts of things where we need to have the discussion and the debate, and you know that the Productivity Royal Commission, um, Productivity Royal Commission, that sort of thing, the Productivity <laughs> Commission called for um, submissions on that and the report's been given to the government, but unless someone else along the table's got it, I've not seen it. But they are issues which I think are of concern to the profession and if we are, to pick up Peter Reardon's point, to re maintain our professional standards, we need to look at and learn from what's happened in the US where there have been problems and see if we can't put in place a system which is going to protect ultimately those who are trying to get access to justice. Thank you. Peter, are those conflicts of interest issues a real problem? I mean, they seem to be to me. Um, I think they are. I have to say, I think that the figures quoted by Justice Gordon about the combined costs of lawyers and funders um, in the USA and Australia are quite compelling, but there is this residual problem, I think, that we've experienced with conflicts of interest. We experience already with no win, no fee cases when you're involved in them. What's, what strikes you if you read the draft Productivity Commission report is there is this identification of the, uh, of the need for increased access to justice and the fact that what we all know is that litigation can be too expensive for a large number, a large group in our community. And then there's the statement that things like contingency fees will increase litigation and they say, well, there you go, that will solve that problem. I'm not convinced that all that's right. Mm -hmm. I'm not convinced 
that in our society good claims generally are not run by uh, lawyers who are prepared to do it on no win, no fees or come to arrangements which will ensure that claims that are good claims should be run. And we know that for generations personal injuries claims have been run by solicitors and barristers on the basis that if they don't win, uh, nobody charges a fee. It, it's been promoted as no win, no fee since about the 90s, but that's been around for uh, as long as certainly I can remember. And so I'm not convinced that contingency fees will solve that problem. Contingency fees will enable big claims to result in big profits. It will result undoubtedly in conflicts and therefore I am I think that we should um, inquire about how lawyers should be more properly remunerated for taking risks on no win, no fee cases. I think the 25% standard doesn't work. It's, it's, ex it's inadequate for people who take, lawyers who take large risks. It's excessive for people who run claims that are effectively assessments of damages, so there's no risk. And therefore that doesn't work in my opinion, but I don't think that our profession uh, should contemplate contingency fees, certainly not off the back of the analysis of the Productivity Commission. Thank you, Peter. Now, I'm very mindful that at this point we're probably keeping you all from afternoon tea. So just before I hand over to David for the final word, I'd like to thank everyone who's come to present on this. Um, if you want to read more, Jason's written a book about it, co-authored a book, um, many judgments of Justice Gordon, um, and obviously far more that we can direct you to if you're interested. But uh, over to you, David. Well, thank you. If you just go to the last slide, we're talking about contingency fees. That's Willie Gray um, with his, one of his jets, the Wings of Justice. Um, he's one of the uh, better, the you know, more well-known southern uh, plaintiff lawyers. Um, uh, and there's also another photo of the other jet, um, if you could click through, uh, which is a 737. Um, you can get on his website and get an internal tour of the fit out of that jet if you'd like. It's really grotesque. But um, he, obviously, <laughs> he obviously has a lot of money. Now, um, that is, contingency fees does create massive profits for the lawyers. So if they get through, you're all welcome on my jet. Um, but, um, but also, just to keep in mind the way the plaintiff bar thinks in the US, as my colleagues told a story last night, the plaintiff bar flew in on their private jet, it was a firm. Um, they inquired as to the value of hotel rooms in the area. They thought they were far too expensive, so they went and bought a house uh, to house everyone for the three months that they were going to run the case. They actually lost the case, but when they sold the house six months later, they made a tidy profit. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the future we could be looking at. Thank, Thank you very you. much, everybody. On that note, <laughs> we're